Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Anne. And thanks, uh, thanks, tech support there. So I, I, I'm, what I'm going to do is give you, uh, well, I'm going to talk mainly about Alzheimer's disease. But let me just say what the history of the genetics in general is. And that is we started, I'm going to say, in the 90s till about 2005 uh, with positional cloning, identifying one gene at, at a time by positional cloning and of course that gave us an enormous amount of information and actually in Alzheimer's disease gave us animal models. Then starting in about 2005 uh, with the golden years perhaps from 2005 to 2015 we started to do genome-wide association studies. These identified low-risk variants across the genome which influence one's risk of developing uh, common diseases, or actually, in the case of Huntington's disease, allowed us to find uh, variants which influenced one's uh, risk, one's age at onset in a in a in a in, a, in what's essentially a monogenic disorder. And then, from 2015 and ongoing now, exome and genome sequencing um, to find higher risk variants. Actually, I think it's going, there might be a fourth phase, which is whole genome sequencing to find uh, hidden repeat, uh, expanded repeats, which you heard from Henry Holden earlier on. So, of course, though, that simple history is, um, uh, is blurred at the edges. We're still finding genes by, for example, positional cloning. But that's the essence. And I think that what's changed in the last few years, in the last couple of years really, is we are starting to uh, use bioinformatic analyses to predict uh, pathways and genes. And you might have heard Mina Wright and talking about some of that type of work earlier on. So that's, if you like, a potted history of molecular genetics and of course grossly oversimplified. And what I will also say though is that we are going back perhaps to understanding the pathology. I'm going to talk 90% about Alzheimer's disease, but I'm going to mention the other diseases. This is the pathology. We never knew which part of this pathology came first. We had never put it in sequence. Uh, this is the complex pathology, and now I think we can put it in sequence because of molecular genetics. I'm not going to talk about Parkinson's disease, but I am going to say the deposition here in the nigra is largely of a protein called synuclein and in the tangle diseases uh, where there is an autosomal dominant form of the disease the deposited protein is the uh, the tau uh, protein and there is both ftdp that's the familial form of the disease which are caused by tau mutations and the sporadic form and this is psp and an overriding point and and i'm going to come back to this at the very end is that in all of these protein deposition disorders, one way of getting the disease is simply by making too much. I don't have time to talk about the effects of all the mutations, but, but it's worth noting that the simplest way of getting these diseases, APP gene duplications in Alzheimer's disease, synuclein du gene duplications in Parkinson's disease, and tau gene duplications uh, in uh, frontotemporal dementia, this tells us that these proteins are close to what one might call their crystallization point. And I'm making that point from a genetic perspective. I don't have time to talk about exactly how the all the mutations work, but the autosomal dominant mutations are all consistent with this. And I'm making this from at uh, this point from a genetic perspective. Michel Vendroscolo made essentially the same point from a protein chemistry point of view and said that all of these proteins are close to their, I'm going to call it crystallization point. So we found APP uh, mutations, point mutations originally uh, by positional cloning. Peter Hislop found uh, uh, presenilin uh, in 1995 by positional cloning of the presenilin gene. This is the presenilin protein uh, drawn out in, to show its functional role 
in that presenilin is the major enzyme which is responsible for cleaving the amyloid precursor protein about here. And so all the autosomal dominant forms of the disease are captured in this little uh, cartoon uh, showing that this is the initiating point of those rare cases of disease with, um, which are autosomal dominant. And as I have indicated, all the mutations make amyloid deposition more likely. Now, this is how we normally uh, draw amyloid um, metabolism, APP metabolism. Here is uh, the APP molecule. This is the amyloidogenic pathway, cleavage first by base here at the N-terminal, and secondly by presenilin gamma secretase at the C-terminal. And here is the what one might call the good pathway with alpha secretase cleavage here, which yields this smaller fragment, and we call and followed by the gamma secretase. Now I'm showing this diagram just to to kind of uh, orient you, but a point I'm going to make is that we draw amyloid going off into the extracellular space here. But many groups, and this is just uh, Amanda Hesselgrave, Henrik Zetterberg's group show. Uh, but everyone who works with amyloid knows this, is that amyloid is extremely hydrophobic. And yet we always draw it going off into the extracellular space. I'm going to come back to this point later on. Now, what's happened as we reach the risk gene era? And the first thing that happened is that by sequencing, Rudy Tanzi, and we have confirmed this, found mutations in alpha secretase. So mutations which inhibit this process make this process more likely and make uh, so that is also then, although these mutations are rare, it's also consistent with the amyloid hypothesis that amyloid is where it starts. And this paper from DECODE showed mutations which inhibit this process, inhibit here, make Alzheimer's disease less likely. Again, consistent. Now, moving on then to GWAS. What we expected as we looked for risk genes, I'm sure that we all thought this, was we'd find more amyloid processing path genes. This, however, is what we did find. The chromosomes were along the bottom, and these are the loci that turned out from the GWAS that's updated on an almost monthly basis, now many, many genes, about 70. Um, in fact, what we found was Although there are some of them, here is ADAM10, which are involved in APP processing, the vast majority, and this excellent paper from Leslie Jones makes that point, the vast majority of them are, are either involved in the innate immune system, which in the context of the brain largely means microglia, or involved in lipid metabolism. And that was actually entirely unexpected. Well, at least from myself. I, I was very surprised to see this. We had started to do exome sequencing, and by a convoluted route, we found a high-risk variants in TREM2 were a risk for Alzheimer's disease. The DECO group made the same finding at the, uh, and pu published back-to-back. -back. And actually, when we published our papers, we were told of this paper 30 years previously, uh, which had predicted a relationship between the, the, um, between a rare form uh, of uh, leukodystrophy and Alzheimer's disease, which our data confirmed. So this paper deserves citation as well. And when we were doing this work, complete, a completely separate part of the lab was looking at the effects of amyloid deposition in mice on gene expression. And what we found was that exactly the same gene was the gene which um, was uh, most upregulated in response to amyloid deposition. So we had two findings, completely one might say uh, coincidental, by finding gene mutations we identified TREM2, and by looking at gene expression in response to amyloid deposition, we found TREM2 was the gene which was the most responsive in the genome to amyloid deposition. And this is our data from 2014 showing in the top left panel all the genes which responded
to amyloid deposition. And these other five genes were also had been reported as microglial genes uh, which were involved in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this is where I'm saying now that bioinformatics is beginning to tell us genes because we can see then that there is a network of, bio, of amyloid responsive genes which are genetically associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we asked a very simple question. Dervis Saleh with Valentina Escott Price asked this series of questions. Is there a, an overrepresentative of significant associations with amyloid, amyloid response? And the answer to that was yes. Does that overrepresentation is still there even if we account already known loci? Still yes. Our paper is bottom right here. Which genes are contributing to this? This is the amyloid response module. Here's TREM2 at the center of it. And here are the genes which were previously known. And it allowed us to declare statistically that these were also Alzheimer uh, risk genes. These are those genes. I won't go through them, except to say that I'm going to come back to OAS at the very end of my talk. In fact, many of them have been previously, by pathology, implicated in amyloid response by pathological investigations. So we can now say that the, many of the genes involved in late-onset Alzheimer's disease are a response involved in the response to amyloid deposition. And this, then, is how we're beginning to use bioinformatic analysis. So our summary, my summary for Alzheimer's disease. Early onset disease, amyloid production. Some risk loci are also involved in amyloid production, but the majority are late onset, and they are amyloid resp the, uh, 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 microglial lipid metabolism, and they are amyloid responsive. So this is... This is where we are up to. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of the genes which are known. And this is these two, ABCA7, which is a phospholipid, um, a phospholipid transporter, and TREM2, which I've already, already mentioned, which is a phospholipid receptor. And so now I'm just going to tell you what I think is going on. And this is, I emphasize, this is a hypothesis. We've always drawn amyloid response like this, with amyloid going off into the extracellular space. But what I suspect is happening is amyloid buildup actually initiates in the membrane. And in the membrane, it disrupts the membrane. And what you're seeing is a microglial, an APOE response to that membrane disruption. And you get late onset Alzheimer's disease when, uh, when that response starts to fail. So it's the, the period when you're amyloid responsive is, uh, when amyloid deposition is initiated, is coped with largely by your microglial metabolism. So in, and I'm now going to expand what I'm saying. In all diseases, and this includes Parkinson's and, and the Tangle diseases, overproduction of the protein leads to the dominant disease. In all diseases, uh, part of the risk of disease is a failure to clear. With amyloid, it's microglia. With synuclein, it's largely lysosomes. And with tau, it's largely the proteasome. This is, so I just want to say maybe there's nothing distinctive about these proteins. Maybe just as Vendroscolo said, they are close to their deposition uh, threshold. Now, I'm just really, and, and I just wanted to do this. It's not on my schedule or anything. I just think this is really interesting. And that is, we, we published OAS1 nearly 18 months ago now. And uh, since then, of course, we've all been hit by COVID. And the genes involved in severe COVID, so this is not in uh, whether you get the disease, but whether you do badly in when you get the disease. Those that has turned out to be largely relating to interferon. So people with autoantibodies to interferons are one group of people who do badly, and people with inborn er errors of interferon immunity also, uh, sorry, inborn uh, in, with genetic mutations 
in the inter interferons uh, also do badly. They are two groups of, of rare groups of people who do, do very badly. A couple of interesting things then a gene was of those who do badly. The first gene that was found here by Svante Pabo was on chromosome 3 and it's a Neanderthal gene. One only 1% 1 of the genome in Europe comes from Neanderthals. This more complete analysis from Kenneth Bailey in Edinburgh, uh, uh, which actually is just about or has just come out in nature. This is the, uh, the Med Archive version of it. This is the GWAS. This is the one that uh, was found before. And here is OAS1. So uh, the same uh, and these, the same locus that we have found as Alzheimer risk gene is also in the response to oh, to um, to uh, whether determines is part of the risk of whether you get uh, a bad COVID, so to speak. And the interesting thing is that it turns out that this locus too is a Neanderthal derived gene. So you have two of the top genes are involved in um, are, that are involved in bad COVID are Neanderthal derived. I think remarkable. I'll also just briefly mention this gene DPP nine here. I showed in my earlier slide CXCL10, and the only known function of CXCL, sorry, the only known function of this gene is to cleave CXCL10. So maybe this is also part of the same pathway. So to summarize, the bad, bad outcomes in COVID disease are predisposed to interference uh, signals and two of them are Neanderthal derived and the chances of that are remarkable. What that suggests to me is that there has been some form of selection sweep in European populations. So of course we know there have been previous pandemics, uh, you know, Black Death, Spanish flu, and so on and so forth. We know that we have been affected by pandemics before. We can see that certainly in the, in the absence of medical care, one might expect very high mortalities. And for some reason, the ne inheriting Neanderthal alleles affect one's risk. And Neanderthal alleles have been selected for in the European population. But very interestingly, uh, from an Alzheimer point of view, the gene that Dervis identified is part of the interferon response and is shared uh, with um, th with this risk uh, locus uh, for for um, for bad COVID. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for keeping so well to time. Really appreciate that. So, do we have any questions for John? Perhaps while people are thinking about that, um, I'd just like to, I mean, the OAS um, link is a, a, a really fascinating. Um, do you think that has that been borne out by any epidemiological studies over the COVID epidemic? How, what sort of things? You, well, of course, I don't know quite what you're asking, but <laughs> there, there have been reports that people with outside, you know, of a of risk of Alzheimer's disease getting bad COVID is mm. is uh, is high, but I don't think this OAS one gene is the resp is responsible for that. I mean, I think that it's much more to do with the fact that bad COVID got into into care homes. So that's and of course there's lots of um, lots and lots of um, lots of people in care homes died terribly. No. Okay. So, so I that, don't think that, the epidemiological link is, although it, one could make that case, I don't think it's genuine. Okay. Thank you. So a couple of questions come in. Um, what do you think is a better future treatment approach, targeting amyloid preemptively, possibly vaccine, or improving the immune response to plaque removal? Well, actually, the thing I'm most excited about is uh, is uh, an is antisense therapies. Uh, frankly, uh, and uh, you know, I think it's very exciting. We've got the uh, Leonard Wolfson Center and the uh, the grant. Uh, of course, I, I can't imagine that uh, that that Sarah isn't going to talk about anti-sense therapies <laughs> later on. I I can't imagine she's she's going to use the word 
anti-sense in her talk, but I think that the idea of reducing the substrate and, the, if you like, the pressure on the pathways is a very good one. Of course, improving one's microglial response, that would be great. Of course, a valid target, but, you know, making biology work better is a difficult thing. It's making biology works, work better is a difficult thing. So I do think targeting the microglial response is a good target, but it's a difficult target. Okay. Um, we've got and probably time for one more question. Um, what is known about the genetics influencing the rate of progression of neurodegenerative disease? Are there any commonalities emerging across different diseases? Uh, rate of progression, well, actually, yes. The, we have a paper, Hugh Morris and Ed Jabari with Mariam Shoai and my group have got a paper in Lancet Neurology in January or February, uh, which, uh, it, where we've looked at rate of progression of, of a progressive su suclean nuclear palsy and found that the top hit is, in fact, LERC2. And LERC2 is actually known as a Parkinson gene. So there is a direct commonality, if you like, between a uh, rate of progression of PSP and uh, a gene for Parkinson's disease. It's mm. on online on Lancet Neurology, and I think it's, it's either on BioArchive or MedArchive. 